Jebedee, Jebedee, Jebedee. Okay, welcome back. Robert Breaker here, missionary evangelist to the English and Spanish speaking people. And today we're going to look at the Old Testament tabernacle or the Old Testament sanctuary. And we're going to look at this from the scriptures, but also from a uh, type, looking back from the New Testament, looking at the type. Now, there's a lot of books that have been written on this and everything, and I've studied a bunch of them. And I'm going to teach you what many preachers teach. Okay, I'm going to teach this the way that many who do preach and teach this teach it. But I'm also going to put my little twist on it, too. I've been studying this for a while now. And actually, I'm, I'm sorry. I want to apologize. I should have preached this probably two, three, four years ago. Uh, I started on YouTube in, what, 2007, 2008? But I just put up a video every now and then and hardly did very many. It wasn't until 2014 that I started every single week doing a new sermon in English and Spanish. And yes, I've missed a couple of Sundays because I travel and I preach as well. I am a missionary evangelist and I do have a ministry other than YouTube. But uh, I've been busy <clears throat> and I've been traveling around. And so in my early uh, starting to put things every week, this is one of the sermons that I wanted to get out. Actually, I have a couple more over there that I wanted to do. And uh, hopefully this year, 2020, I can get back. We've been covering a lot of meat lately, so I want to get back to the basics, back to some milk. But today, we're going to look at this, the Old Testament tabernacle or the sanctuary. And I'm going to explain it to you as the Bible tells what it is. And this is going to be pretty brief. This is not going to be an extensive. I mean, my wife and I were talking the other day, and I told her, I, I believe the Lord would have me to preach and teach on the tabernacle. And she said, oh, you could go on for hours. And I said, yeah, yeah, I could. She said, well, you could do three or four. I said, yeah. But I kind of just want to do a brief overview, just get you familiar with what the Old Testament tabernacle is. A lot of people that are Christians, especially uh, new Christians that's recently gotten saved, they don't know what the Old Testament tabernacle was and what it was about and how it worked and what was in it. So I just want to give you this as kind of a basic, brief um, introduction and understanding to what the Old Testament tabernacle is. And then looking from the New Testament back, we're going to kind of get an idea of salvation today. There's a lot of Old Testament verses that, that apply to the New Testament in type. So as we look at the Old Testament in type, we look in the New Testament and go, wow, that's a type of our salvation today, and that's a type of this, and that's a type of that, and, and we can see it. But put yourself again in the mindset of those Old Testament people. There are a lot of things they didn't know. A lot of things that Paul said were for us today um, were a mystery back then. So there's a lot of things in the Old Testament that were a mystery. So what we're going to do today, I want to show you the, the Old Testament tabernacle or the Old Testament sanctuary. And I want you to see how, yeah, it, it, it is a type of salvation in a way. But I'm also going to put some uh, of my study in there as well. So I'm, I'm going to give you some of the points that others do. And many people, they, they teach it this way. I'm going to teach it the way they teach it. And then I'm going to add some of the things that I found. And I said, oh, look at what this, Lord showed me this, Lord showed me this. I'm going to add that to it as well. And I want you to see what it is. So the Old Testament tabernacle. Now, this is a little different than the temple. The temple was built by Solomon. So the Old Testament tabernacle in the book of Exodus, what we're going to study today, would be the tent in the wilderness. And eventually, later, David wanted to build God a house, and that was the temple. But it was still had the same setup, pretty much. But under the Old Testament, well, you had the law. And that law was given by God to Moses. And if you know your whole Bible, you know we have main characters in the Bible. The most important one, I guess, would be Adam at first, because he was the first man. And then, you know, you had the flood, so you had Noah. God chose Noah. We wouldn't be here if it hadn't built the ark. And then you had Abraham. And then Moses. And then Moses was the one God says, now look, I'm going to give you this law. And so God gave Moses the law of the Old Testament. And in that law, God said, this is what I want. I want you to build a tabernacle. Now, why? All right, let's start out today. And before I put up here and draw a diagram, and then again, I'm not the best at drawing diagrams, but I want to draw a diagram of the tabernacle and explain it to you and show you what it is. But before we do that, let's go to Exodus chapter 25. Exodus 25, verses 1 through 9. Exodus 25, 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, here we go, 
This is in the wilderness. Remember they had left Egypt and gone into the wilderness for 40 years, and this is when God gave Moses all these things. Verse 2, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering, and of every man that giveth it willingly, how's that? If you're a Calvinist, you don't believe in free will, and yet there's the word willingly in the Bible. The word free will shows up 17 times in the Bible. I'm not a Calvinist. But it says, Giveth it willingly with his heart, he shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass, and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and for the sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary. Okay, that's one of the reasons why we call it a sanctuary as well, the Old Testament tabernacle. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And then verse 9, according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. So as you're reading through the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus is kind of a little bit dull in some ways because there's so much in the book of Exodus and you read it and you go, oh man, it's kind of boring. But when you get it together in your mind and you see what it's all about, it, it's not really that boring. It, it helps us to understand the Bible. So I'm going to try to draw a diagram up here. Again, I am not the best at drawing diagrams, so please excuse the fact that I'm not an artist. But let's draw out here the Old Testament um, tabernacle in the wilderness, what it would be like. Now, if you don't like my drawing, well, there's lots of drawings on Google. I actually went on there and looked, and you can go to Google or Start Page or, or Yahoo or whatever and put in images and then put in tabernacle of the Old Testament. And there's a lot of good um, things there as well that will show you. So, the Old Testament tabernacle in the wilderness is told what it should be like, and we read about it in the Old Testament. And it tells us that it's like this, okay? I'm going to have to draw it out here, so excuse me, I might take a little bit here, but I need to draw it out so you can get a hold of, of what it is. So, the first thing you have is the courtyard. And the courtyard... It's where anybody could walk in. And the courtyard is where the sinners came in order to offer the sacrifice for their sins. And they walked right in through. And there was a fence all the way around this thing. And it was divided into three sections. And the courtyard started out with the brazen altar. And the brazen altar was the place that when the sinner came in, he met the priest. And then the priest would come, and the priest would take the blood, and then they would burn the offering here on the brazen offer, uh, the brazen altar. So this is called the brazen altar. Why? Because it's made of brass. In English, in America, we use a Z. In the King James Bible, it's an S, kind of reminding us that it's made of brass. That's the brazen altar. The next thing is the laver. Now this is where they had the water to wash and to get clean from what they were doing. So they had to be clean. God wouldn't accept those Jews that were the priests unless they were clean. So they had to be clean, and they were always having to wash themselves and be clean in order to do the work of the Lord, which was to help with the sacrifice. Now, then you have this over here. This is what they called the holy place. Now, not just anybody could walk in here. This was where the, the priest came in, but not just anybody could come in here. So if you're a typical sinner, you could only walk around the courtyard, but you weren't allowed in here. This was for priests only. And on one side over here, you had this table. And there was one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. There were 12 pieces of bread. And this is what was called the show bread. So this is what they call the table of showbread. And this was put out every day, and they had to cook the bread, and they put it out. and had 12 pieces, 12 tribes of Israel, maybe one for every one of the tribes. Over here on this side, you had a golden candlestick made of gold. And the golden candlestick was supposed to be kept lit all the time. So the priest had to always keep coming in here and putting out new bread every day 
and daily bread, if you will. And then they had to keep this candlestick lit, which would be a light. So they had to have light. Now there was this place here called the Most Holy Place. And this is where, if you read your Old Testament, God dwelt. So this is where God was staying. And he had this gigantic, huge veil. The veil. And so this huge veil was here. And then inside the most holy place was what was called the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant set here. So this is really interesting. Now, if you know your Old Testament, you had these two uh, uh, angels, and they had their wings before and, be and, and below. And over here, in the middle of the Ark of the Covenant, there was the mercy seat. And the mercy seat was right there. And that's where every uh, year, once a year, the priest would come in with the blood, and he'd offer it right there on the mercy seat every year for all of Israel. And it was a yearly sacrifice for the people of Israel. So this, more or less, is your Old Testament tabernacle. This is how it's laid out. And the way that God set it up, it was from east to west. So over here would be east that you entered in, and then over here would be west. And an interesting thing, that history runs from east to west. If you study the history of the world, it's always going in a, in a circle, east to west. Now, thankfully, God was able to bring many of the Jews back that went west, back east. And they're over now in the Middle East. I find that interesting. But most of history runs east to west. So this is called the, the tabernacle. It's also called the sanctuary. We read in Exodus 25, 8. In Exodus 23, 19, it's also called the house of God. And in 1 Kings 6, 1 through 3, it's known as the temple. Because once Israel got their land that was promised to them, well, then God chose David's son uh, to build the temple, Solomon. But this is how it was all laid out. Now, we're going to talk about that today, and it's kind of a type of salvation. And the tabernacle shows us, once again, Old Testament versus New Testament salvation. How different it is in the Old Testament compared to the New Testament. And as I study this, I can't help but see, wow, there's so many differences in the Old Testament than in the New. But let's go into this. Let's look at each one. The first thing we see here, the first thing, and boy, am I going to have enough room? I hope so. There's seven main things in there that bring that catch our attention. And I'm off the side here, so let me go ahead and put one. I guess that's good, number one. That should show up. It'll be very close to the corner. But the first thing is that brazen altar. And the brazen altar is the first thing that you would see if you were under the Old Testament law and you sinned and you wanted to have your sin forgiven, you would come into this courtyard and the first thing you would see is this right here. And there most likely would have been a priest standing right there waiting for you saying, okay, how may I help you? And while well, you would bring in your animal, probably a sheep or a lamb or however you want to, and, and you would bring that animal in and he would attend to you as you sacrificed that animal for your sin. And uh, we read that before. Matter of fact, the last two um, sermons that we did, we talked about um, what if we didn't have the New Testament? And then the next one was what if we didn't have the Old Testament? And I went into that and how in the Old Testament, uh, a sacrifice for sin, Leviticus 4, I believe it is, talks about how a man, if he sinned, he has to bring a sacrifice, has to put his hand on the offering and cut the throat. And the priest is there to catch the blood. And he offers the blood and then he puts it on the altar. Now, what would that be a type of? What would that remind you of? Well, that would remind you of the penalty for sin. Because right there, the brazen altar, did you know it had another name in Exodus 38, 1? It's also called the altar of burnt sacrifice. And that altar was supposed to be burning all the time. There's supposed to always be some flame in there. So the first thing you would have seen as you came in is you would have seen fire. And you would have said, you know what that is? That's, a, that's the penalty uh, for my sin if I don't get forgiveness. Because the way to find forgiveness, Leviticus 4 in the Old Testament, was through your blood sacrifice of an animal. 
And so the first thing you see would be those flames. And you go, whoa. And you kind of probably would have shivered a little bit and went, uh, I don't want to go to hell. Well, I sure, what, I sure want forgiveness of my sins. So I'm glad I got this sacrifice. I'm glad I can bring this. And that was a picture of the penalty of fire is what happens if you are lost. That's where your soul goes when you die. And so you would have come and you would have said, yeah, I want that sacrifice. I want that, those flames. I need that sacrifice made for me. And you would make that sacrifice. Now, thank God, today, the sacrifice is made with Jesus. So I'm so thankful that Jesus made that sacrifice for us. And we don't have to do that. We don't have to come to any place here on earth and look for forgiveness in a specific location, in a specific way. We are saved today through the blood of Christ, what Jesus did on the cross. The next thing you would have seen, and this is what a lot of preachers preach, and they preach how this Old Testament tabernacle is a type of salvation. So, we get saved by forgiveness of sins through the sacrifice. The next thing we need is what? Well, after we're saved, we should live for Jesus. The next thing that you would see as you were in the tabernacle uh, sacrificing, you would see a laver of brass. Now, a laver is a place to wash. I find it interesting. In Spanish, lavar, L-A-V-A-R, is to wash. In a lot of our words in English, we have something close to it in Spanish. It's quite interesting. So this is where the priests would wash themselves in order to be clean, in order to do what they do. And so it was a type of purification. And so what many preachers do is they preach, well, we get saved today through a blood sacrifice, and then once we're saved, why well, God wants us to live a holy lifestyle. He wants us to live pure and holy and righteous. And so the Bible says that the Bible is kind of like water. I believe it's in Ephesians 5, when it's washing of the water by the word, it says. When we get saved, when we get forgiveness of our sins today, well, we need to keep reading the Bible, keep reading the Bible, keep reading the Bible. Go by what the Bible says. The Bible helps us to live a clean, holy lifestyle. And it's called the foot, and it was mostly for them to wash their feet. So this, this brazen altar here, this is the sacrifice. This is where the sacrifice is made. So I'll put that up there on the thing there. And the la laver reminds us of sanctification. 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 Or living clean, living holy. And the Bible is what we're supposed to read and help us. Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth, Jesus says. So we need to, as Christians, live a holy lifestyle. And they had to clean their feet. And uh, I think today, what does the New Testament talk about? The feet. Well, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel. I find that interesting. Let's preach the gospel and uh, do that. Uh, we don't need priests today in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, they had to have priests because the priests were the ones that helped them with that. Today, we don't need help. We come to Christ alone as individuals for salvation. But anyway, the next thing you would see, if they would let you inside, which begin, this was only for the priest, but if you were a priest and you walked into the holy place, you would have seen something. Oh, you know what I left off? I left something off here, too. This is the altar of incense. And we will get to that here in a second, but I completely forgot it. Sorry about that. But um, let me put it where it needs to go. It needs to go right in the very middle, and I'll show you why here in a little bit. I'm going to put it right there in the very middle where it should be. Now, the next thing you would see as you walked in, if you looked over to your right, you'd see this table of showbread. And the table of showbread was put there for the priests. I guess they ate it. I remember one time David was uh, going along and he was hungry and the Lord allowed him to go in and eat the showbread. Well, in the Bible, David is a king, but he's also uh, a priest. He's also a prophet. There are few people in the Bible that are like Christ in type. Christ was a prophet, priest, and king. Well, David was in type a prophet, priest, and king. We see David offering sacrifice one time. Now, here we have the table of showbread. It's found in Exodus 25, 30. And it reminds us of the printed word. Now, many of the guys that like to preach this, they didn't have anything for this one. Most of them, they all start with a P. So I said, well, if you're going to have it all start with a P, I'll add P, printed word. 
Why do I say it reminds us of the printed word? Well, it reminds us of the full canon of the Bible. The 66 books. Because in the Bible, it's funny how these are laid out. They're laid out six and six. And you know what? That reminds us of the scriptures. Because the King James Bible, our Bible, is 66 books. And the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And the King James Bible spells show, not S-H-O-W, S-H-E-W. <laughs> show bread. What is the word of God like? Bread. Give us this day our daily bread, Jesus said. The word of God is like bread. And these priests had to eat it daily. Well, daily we should be reading our Bible. So I find that interesting. Now you got the table of showbread there. Reminds us of the Word, because the Word of God is like bread. Then on the other side, you have the candlestick. So once you're saved, why, you need to read the Word of God. It's like water. Well, you're supposed to eat and drink every day. So you read the Word of God. It's like water. It helps you live a clean life, clean your life up. Um, bread, it's like eating bread. But then the other thing is the candlestick. So the candlestick is on this other side, and it's supposed to light up this room because this here had a top over it made out of different kinds of skins. It was like a tent. So all this was not exposed to the sun. It was covered. Now the courtyard was open, but this was covered. And this is where you could come and get a shade, I guess, if you were a priest. And the candlestick reminds us of power, many preachers say. The power of God. Now, to me... It reminds me of the fire of God. The fire of God. When you get saved, you get on fire for the Lord, don't you? And then what do you want to do? You just want to go around and share with everybody the gospel. What is the gospel? Light. What does a candlestick give? Light. Paul talks about the light of the gospel. <laughs> well, when we're saved, we should go out and we should try to win people to the Lord. So that reminds me of the fire of God. And what it else it reminds me of is this, sharing the gospel, because the gospel is like, like, sharing the gospel. Now, if you haven't figured it out yet, here's what I'm doing. A lot of people preach on the tabernacle, and when they do, they all have the same outline, and they all start with a P. The penalty, the purification, the printed word, the power. Well, I'm, I've did my own study. You know, I don't want to just come to you and preach what some other guy preaches. I mean, I actually study for myself. So, the brazen offer, well, that's the flames of hell in type. The uh, lever of brass, well, that's getting your feet clean. Uh, remember when Jesus said, you know, I'm going to wash your feet, Peter? And he says, not me. He says, wash me all. He says, if you're already cleansed, all you need is to daily be cleansed, your feet clean. Um, the full canon of Scripture and how it's a type of fire. You get on fire for the Lord when you get saved and you want to win people to the Lord. The next thing is this altar of incense. Now, like I said, there's seven things that I see. A lot of preachers only say six, but God always uses the number seven, so I went ahead and added uh, uh, the seventh one because it's right there. But anyway, so the fifth one is the altar of incense. Incense. And the altar of incense is found in Exodus 30 and verse 1. And a lot of people say, well, that's a type of prayer. Okay. I mean, if you want to say that, sure. We that are Christians, we should pray daily. <laughs> and prayer, while well, that goes up to God and He hears our prayers. And the altar of incense, it's like a sweet-smelling savor that goes up to the Lord. So others say, well, no, it's more like praise. We should praise God daily. And praise in God, well, that's something God enjoys. Just like uh, incense. You burn incense and you enjoy the smell. You go, mm, that, ma that makes me happy. Uh, I like to say it like this. Well, the altar of incense, that's fruit. The more we do for the Lord and more we live for God, well, the more fruit we have for Him, well, that's what's a sweet-smelling savor to God. When we do right, and we live for Him, and we produce fruit as a Christian, well, that makes God happy. So, to me, I, I, just, I think it's a good type of fruit. But what else is it? Well, it's a sweet-smelling savor, the Bible says. So, it's a savor. It's something that God enjoys in our lives. Well, are you reading your Bible? Are you trying to live a holy life? Are you sharing the gospel with other people? If so, well, God's happy. He looks at it and goes, man, I'm, I'm glad they're doing that. And He's excited about it. Are you? You know, a lot of people get to be saved and they don't really grow as a Christian, and that's a shame. 
So we got this Old Testament, and it really gives us a, a lot of interesting stuff, and it gives us a, a lot of ideas of, well, as a Christian, I just want to get as close to God as I can. And where was God in the Old Testament? Why well, he dwelt in the most holy place. So we want to get as close to him when we're saved as we can. How do we do that? Through prayer, through reading the Bible, through sharing the gospel with others, and things like that. Well, the next thing we have here is the veil. And the veil reminds me of purity. You see, God is so holy and so pure that you can't just go to him and look at him and get to him. He's a holy, he's a righteous God. And there are some places in the Old Testament why someone said, God, I want to look at you, I want to see you. And God said, well, if, you just, if, you, if I let you see me, you burst into flames. You couldn't take it. I'm so holy, I'm so righteous. The Bible says our God's a consuming fire. Why, if you looked on me, you just burst into flames. Um, God, one time, uh, Moses said, I want to see you, God. He says, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put you in a rock. I'm going to, I'm going to pass by you and let you see my backside, which I don't understand, but that's what he said. God is such a holy, righteous God that he doesn't put up with sin. There's, there was something there, and, and, and it separated in the Old Testament them to where your average person couldn't get to God. He was so holy. So that veil was there. That veil reminds me of the separation that came from Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve sinned, what happened? Why, that separated them from God. Now they couldn't get to God. And under the Old Testament law, God says, look, the average person can't get to me and I can't fellowship with them. They've got to have forgiveness. And I'll talk to them through the priests, but they can come. But today, what a blessing. Today, we can talk to God. We can come boldly before the throne of grace through the blood of Jesus Christ. So I find that as, as awesome. And I, and I believe it, it reminds me, that veil, of the fallen nature of man. And how man in the Old Testament could not get to God on his own. He could only come to God in a certain way, and the only way God would allow man to approach him was through a blood sacrifice. And after that blood sacrifice was made, well, then man could have something to do with God. But God was so holy, he couldn't put up with sin. He hated it. He despised it. The next thing is the ark. It's also called, curiously enough, the mercy of seat. It's called a mercy seat. Now that would be Exodus 25.10 and Exodus 25.17. And a lot of guys preach, well, this is the presence of God. And so the presence of God in the Old Testament was only found in the most holy place. And yeah, that's true. God wanted to come down and dwell with man, tabernacle with them. And so God, this is what he chose as his place to come, and he dwelt in this place. So that's where his presence was. Now, do you remember the Old Testament when there was a guy, I can't remember his name, but he came and he just walked right in and he goes, I'm going to go, and he opened up the veil and he walked right in and he said, I'm just going to go see God. And he was struck dead and he was killed because God is so holy that you can't just go in and look at God in your mortal flesh, in your mortal body. And so God, the veil there was merciful. <laughs> and once a year they came in and that veil reminds me of how today we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. You see, in the Old Testament, they weren't sealed with the Holy Spirit. The only way they could find God was to come to this tabernacle, but they couldn't just walk right in and say, Hey God, how you doing? And sit down and talk with Him. God's presence was here, and He was so holy, He was separated from them. This is where His presence was. But not everybody could come in. Matter of fact, under that Old Testament law, once a year was when God said, all right, I'm going to allow the high priest. And so this high priest came in once per year. And the Bible tells us that that one sacrifice for sin every year forgave the children of Israel and all of their sins as a nation for that year. And what he did was the high priest came in and he put the blood on the mercy seat. And that blood is what gave mercy. And it's interesting, it's called a mercy seat. Because Paul tells us in the New Testament that when the Antichrist comes into Jerusalem in the tribulation period, he's going to sit in Jerusalem on, on that. And he's going to say, I'm God. So there has to be a rebuilt temple 
So if the Antichrist can come into Jerusalem, he's just going to walk right on in, and he's going to sit down there. He's going to say, hey, everybody, I'm God. Because this is where the presence of God was here on earth in the Old Testament during that time. And they offered up the blood sacrifice once a year for the forgiveness of sins. So that's how it worked in the Old Testament. By the way, when we're talking about the blood, um, uh, one of the books that I uh, studied was this one. This is Peter Ruckman's book on the tabernacle. And uh, a lot of people, they know that I went to Ruckman's Bible school, and I did. And uh, I remember old Ruckman. And old Ruckman used to preach a lot like Robert Breaker. <laughs> Look what he says here in the bottom. How do you get saved? You get saved by trusting the blood atonement on Calvary's cross, paying for your sin debt. <laughs> yeah, amen, that's what Robert Breaker teaches, because that's salvation today. The Old Testament, it would only forgive sins for the past year. And so you had to wait another year to have your sins forgiven, or if you sinned, well, you come here as an individual and you'd offer up a sacrifice for the sin you did. So that was the blood back then. But the blood today of Jesus is what cleanses us from all sin. And today, salvation is not by this tabernacle and by the law and by keeping the law. Salvation today is by faith in the finished work or faith in the blood of Jesus. And that's the verse I got saved on, Romans 3.25, through faith in his blood. And I love Romans 5.11, talking about how you receive the atonement. You take salvation by faith. Just like he says right here. It's like, and, I, and I just showed it to you, but he says... How do you get saved? You get saved by trusting the blood atonement on Calvary's cross, paying your sin debt, taking the penalty that God placed upon himself. Let me show you that one more time. So you take salvation by faith. You receive it. Taking the penalty that God placed by himself. So you say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I come to you and I trust what you've done. I trust your blood for salvation. And when your faith is in the blood atonement of Christ, that's when you're saved. So, back to Exodus chapter... Well, let's go to Exodus 29, 45. And this is what uh, really makes the Old Testament and the New Testament so different. New Testament salvation is not through this. It's through this. And I don't have time to read it, but in, in Hebrews, Paul tells us that in heaven there's a tabernacle. And that when Jesus died on the cross, while well, he went up into the heavens, to this up in heaven, and he offered his blood up on the mercy seat in heaven. And the blood of Jesus is in heaven now, right there. And it forgives of all sins, not just once a year, but for all sins. Now, Exodus 29, 45, the Bible says this. Exodus 29, 45, And I will dwell among the children of Israel, and I will be their God. Well, where did God dwell in the Old Testament? The Bible says it was here in the most holy place. And it was all completely sealed off from everything and no one could get in except once a year. And that high priest had to come in and if he had one drop of sweat on him, or if his sin wasn't forgiven, he would have been killed on the spot. Because God would only accept the high priest who went through all these rituals to cleanse himself and then come in and offer the blood for all of Israel. So this is the Old Testament sanctuary or tabernacle. I hope it's a blessing for you. Uh, I forgot to write up here the, the, the other one. Um, it's a type of fellowship for us today. Today, we have something that they didn't have in the Old Testament. We can fellowship with God whenever we want. God's not in just some place somewhere, and we have to go to that place to try to find God. Where is God today? He's inside of the believer. And that's what's amazing. In the Old Testament, this was the tabernacle. But in the New Testament, guess what the tabernacle is? The body of the believer. And I want to show you that. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And that's what's so amazing to me. We don't need a, a rebuilt temple. We who are Christians, we know that the Jews are going to rebuild their temple one day because they're still thinking they're under the Old Testament and they have to do it this way. But we who are saved, we're like, that's not very smart. <laughs> if you come to Christ, you realize you can have Christ in you. You don't have to have this set up. That was so Old Testament. Now it's New Testament. Now it's through the blood of Christ. And then Christ dwells in you when you're saved. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul says this. Know ye not that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Today when we're saved through the blood of Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. 
We don't have to go to some place on earth and try to find where the presence of God is. When we're saved, He is present in us who believe. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. When you're saved, the God, the Holy Spirit, dwells inside of me. I am not in the Old Testament setup where I have to bring a sacrifice to have my sins forgiven and wait for every year for this priest to go in and forgive of all sins. And that, that's where the presence of God is. I'm saved today, and I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1.13. I have the Holy Spirit of God inside of me. God is present in me when I believe. Through the blood of Christ, through the blood of Christ. What a wonderful thing, what a wonderful thing. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24. Here's what Paul says about it. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24 through 29. Colossians 1, 24, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. We're in the church age. We're not under the Old Testament law. We're in a different time period today. Wherefore I made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. 26. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In the Old Testament, you wanted the presence of God, you had to seek it out. And you had to go to the place, the most holy place. You had to go to this tabernacle and say, you know, I'd really like to find God. <laughs> find forgiveness at least. But you couldn't just sit down and talk with God. Now there were times when, when God would come and talk with someone. The angel of the Lord would show up and talk with people. I understand that. But Paul tells us this was all a type of New Testament salvation in which in the New Testament we have Christ in us. He's not in there anymore. He's in here. When I'm saved, I have Christ in me, the hope of glory. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing. That was a mystery in the Old Testament. Something that they didn't understand, but now we understand. Our bodies are called a tabernacle in the New Testament. Did you know that? Let's go to 2 Peter. Very soon we'll be starting our 1 Peter verse by verse. I'm sorry I'm behind, but it's been a long uh, year last year, and it's getting a slow start this year. But very shortly, hopefully, we'll start our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through 1 Peter. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, notice what Peter calls his body. And this makes me so angry with new versions, or maybe I should call them perversions, of the Bible. Your new versions of the Bible change this. When I was in Honduras, I was trying to preach a message like this. And I used the 1960 when I first went to Honduras. I didn't know any better. And I could not preach from these two verses that I'm about to read because they changed the word. But this is not just the King James word. This is the, this is the word in the Greek language. You don't mistranslate the Bible. Thank God for the King James Bible. It's translated exactly the way God wants us to read it. Now Peter is speaking of his flesh, of his body. And in verse 13 he says, Yeah, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. New version of the Bible say, Well, I'm still here in my body. No, he was making a point. He says, My body is a tabernacle. Why would he say that? Because we're no longer under this Old Testament. The Holy Spirit of God dwells in me now. I'm the tabernacle, not that. So isn't that incredible? Why would you change words in the Bible? You change doctrine. But he says, uh, while I'm in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. Well, he's talking about, you know, I'm going to die soon. And when I die, well, I put off my, as Shakespeare says, I shuffle off my mortal coil. <laughs> I put off my tabernacle. Why is he referring to his body as a tabernacle? Because he knew doctrine. And he understood. Let's go to 2 Corinthians hear what Paul has to say about it. So what a wonderful, 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 wonderful thing salvation is in the New Testament. We have the Holy Spirit of God inside of us who believe and who are saved. And we are the tabernacle. We don't need the Old Testament tabernacle. Old Testament is very different than the New. Although it's a type of the New, sure. But now, where does God dwell? 
we who are saved, we are in Christ, and Christ is in us. So we are his tabernacle. He can dwell inside of the believer. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4 through 8. 2 Corinthians 5, 4. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. What is he saying? We that are in this flesh, we that are in this body, we groan. Being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up in life. What's the context here? The context is we're going to die someday. And our body is mortal. But the new creature inside, why well, that's going to live forever. And when I'm saved, I have the Holy Spirit in me. So that's a blessing. So it's talking about your body. So when he says tabernacle, he's using it as body. Now verse 5, Now that he that hath wrought us for the self -same, same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, our tabernacle, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Verse 8, For we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So if I as a Christian today die, my body goes to the grave, but my soul and the Spirit of God within my spirit takes me to heaven, and I'm absent from the body, but present with the Lord. There's no purgatory. There's no, well, I just go down and my soul sleeps in the grave, and that's soul sleep. No. When you're saved, your soul goes to heaven. But when you're alive, your body is a temple or the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, if you're saved. That's what the Bible teaches. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse 16, and I'll close with this. I wanted to give you this because I thought it'd be a blessing. You know, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, the Bible says that we have three parts. And I'm trying to find a place to put it up here, but i got room, okay. The Bible says we're, we consist of three things. We're a body, we're a soul, and we're a spirit. And this Old Testament tabernacle is a great type of what we are. Just as it's set up here, that's what we're like. The outer courtyard is like our body, our flesh. Every one of us has inside of us a soul. If you're lost, you don't have the Holy Spirit. But if you're saved, why the Holy Spirit of God comes inside of you. And you consist of three parts, body, soul, and spirit. And you get the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. In the Old Testament, He dwelt here in the most holy place. But when we get saved, our body becomes His tabernacle, and our soul is in our body, but He comes in and He dwells in our spirit with the Holy Spirit of God. I find that so amazing. So amazing. It's just such a wonderful thing to know that God dwells in me. And I can talk to Him anytime. He's always there. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I can't lose it. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16. Let's read this. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. So this is called the tabernacle or the sanctuary. Later, through Solomon, it was called the temple. And Paul and even Peter are telling us that our body today, our body now is the tabernacle or the temple of God. Old Testament, it wasn't like that. New Testament, it is. So just another thing to show you that Old Testament is so different from the New Testament, and it really is. And it says in 2 Corinthians 6.16, for ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Well, when you're saved, God is inside of you. So question, are you saved? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Have you come to Christ for salvation? You know, there might be a Jew watching this. The Jews don't get this. The Jews still think this is how we got to get to God, so we've got to rebuild that temple like Solomon had, so we can come back and we can start doing these sacrifices all over again, and we're going to bring our Levitical priest out, and we're going to do everything exactly like it says in the book of Exodus and all throughout the Old Testament law. And they miss it. The Bible says Christ is the end of the law to all who believe. Christ has fulfilled the law. And he fulfilled his promise that he would dwell 
in those who believe. And today, when we get saved, the Holy Spirit dwells in our body, inside of us. And we are His tabernacle, or His temple. That's what the Bible teaches. And I hope you're saved. If you are saved, what should you do? Well, once they got the forgiveness in the Old Testament, then the focus on getting to, to fellowship with God was get clean. Well, our soul is clean through the blood of Christ when we get saved. When we're saved, while we're washed in the blood, and our soul is cleansed through the blood of Christ. But that body, oh, 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 that body. You realize we're still in a sinful body of flesh? And that body wants to do wrong all the time. So we need to get in the book. We need to get in the Bible and read that book. We need to read it daily, just like you eat your daily bread. We need to get in that book for light and say, God, teach me something. Help me understand. Lord, help me to win people to you. Help me, God, to do right and live right so I can be a sweet-smelling savor unto you. And that's how we get closer to God when we are saved. Not to get saved, but when we are saved, we get the Holy Spirit. But we still got to try to keep that body clean. And that's the hardest part of being a Christian, is living a good, holy life. Because that flesh wants to sin so much. But we got to fight. we got to fight the flesh, like Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. Do everything we can to keep from doing evil and wickedness and being a good testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, thank you for watching. I hope this has been a blessing to you. We'll see you next week. God bless. Bye-bye.